We sit here trying to get the mind and the concentration to get it focused on the breath. And all of a sudden we find it someplace else, without any sense that we intended to go someplace else, it's just that we're there. This is a good lesson in how yourself is pretty arbitrary, and there are many selves in there. The self that wants to meditate is one self, the self that wants to think about the distraction, that's another one. And you don't learn about those different selves by just allowing the mind to wander around. You have to put up a fight. As soon as you realize you've slipped off the breath, you've got to come back and be prepared for the next time and try to see what are the signs that the mind is about ready to leave, where its interest in the breath begins to flag, and something else comes in and it jumps. Sometimes the decision is made before you go. It's just waiting for the right opportunity for a lapse in mindfulness. And if you slip off again, try to come to your senses quickly and come back. It's in the coming back that you're strengthening your mindfulness, you strengthen your alertness, you strengthen your ardency, that you really do want to do this. And the more you fight off distraction, the more you see how splintered yourself is into many different selves. And that's an important lesson. We come to practice oftentimes thinking that our sense of self is something that's monolithic. There's me, one big hunk of me or lump of me. And so when you put up a fight like this, you begin to realize there are many yous in there with different agendas, different ideas about what you're would be a good way to spend your time right now. And you begin to see how arbitrary it is that you would identify with them. You are making a choice. Your sense of self is something you create. It's not a given. I remember reading one time there was a question, what is this self that the Buddhism says we're not? It was one of those lineups with lots of different teachers, and they got lots of different answers. And the important part of the lineup was that all the answers are right. When it comes down to whatever you identify as yourself, the Buddha says, no. It's not like he has one definition of self and arbitrarily imposes that on you. You're the one who's defined yourself in different ways. And when you can see that it is an act of definition, then you can begin to look into it as an activity. What are these activities that make yourself? That's where the Buddha has this teaching on the aggregates. Sometimes the aggregates are presented as the Buddha's answer to the question of what you are. Actually, it's the answer to the question, what you, do you think you are? You're made out of these aggregates. You don't see them in action until you try to get the mind into concentration. This is another one of the reasons why concentration is such an important part of gaining insight. Not simply that it gets the mind quiet enough to see what's going on in the mind, but in the process of getting the mind to settle down, struggling with your different selves, and then finally getting the mind to put together a state of concentration where you can begin to stay more and more consistently. You're getting some hands-on experience with those five aggregates. You've got the form sitting here, the form of your body as you feel it from within, the breath in particular as you feel it as it goes through the body. That's form, the first aggregate. The second aggregate is feeling. There may be feelings of irritation here, pain there, pleasure here there. You want to focus on the pleasure. And focusing on the pleasure, together with the breath, you begin to realize how important your perceptions are, the ways you label things. How you picture the breath to yourself is going to have an impact on the kind of feelings you get out of the breath. 
So what picture of the breath do you have right now? Some useful ones that, to replace the idea of the breath coming in and out of the nose and only in and out of the nose. You can think of the body as being filled with all the pores of the skin breathing at the same time, like a sponge. And everything connects inside. Or you can think of the breath as originating inside, not coming from outside. It is, after all, the energy coming from inside. And ask yourself, where does that start? Or where are the many places where it starts? Are they working in unison? Or are there any, is there any conflict among them? And this way you begin to see what your perceptions are and how they have an impact on your experience of the body, the form, and your experience of feeling. And then there's all the conversation inside that's doing this analysis as to what perceptions work, what ways of breathing work. That's fabrication. And then there's just the basic awareness of all these things. These are the basic component factors of your meditation. And you get to know them well as you're putting your concentration together, and also as you begin to notice how the mind slips off a of concentration. Because it's also aggregates that slip you off and try to put you in another world. And sometimes you get to know the aggregates really well as you're staying here with them. And other times you get familiar with them or you begin to catch some insight into them as they're trying to create another world. And you're trying to put a stop to that. And John Lee and John Mahabua talk about the ways in which distractions get started in the mind. And it's interesting, they switch roles in terms of the perception and the fabrication. For John Mahabhu, it's you start with the fabrication, it's just kind of a stirring of energy in the mind. And then you slap a perception on top of that. In the John Lee's analysis, it's the perception that comes first, it's just an image. And then you decide to run with it or not, that's the fabrication. Both ways of understanding it are right. The thing is, in the course of this, this is how you learn what those aggregates are. Because when you first read the Buddha's analysis of suffering, five clinging aggregates, first he starts about talking about the suffering of birth, aging, illness, and death, being separated from what you love, having to be with things you don't like, not getting what you want. It all sounds very familiar. And he says five clinging aggregates. Are what lie at the essence of the suffering in each of those cases. And that doesn't sound familiar at all. But as you're working with the mind, trying to struggle with it to get to settle down, you begin to realize that both the concentration you want and the distractions you don't want are made out of aggregates. And you begin to see how the mind latches onto these things. Where is the point where it decides, yes, I want to go with this set of aggregates rather than that one? That's the clinging. And you look into that a little bit deeper and you say, well, why do I want to cling? Well, what does clinging mean? It means to feed. As the Buddha said, once you become a being, you have to feed. This is why so much our, our sense of ourselves as beings centers around feeding. And it's seeing all these different selves, all these different beings that we t identify with, seeing them struggle is what gives you a chance to get out of them. If you were just one you in here, there'd be no place where you could stand to get a perspective on these things. But fortunately, there are lots of yous in here. And so you use one sense of you to get an insight into other senses of you, to step back from them. to see them as strange. Not only strange, to see them as burdensome, arbitrary. Why would you want to go with them? Once you can think that, that's when you begin to pry yourself loose. And then you get latching on to something else. You say, well, if I don't want to feed that way, there are other ways to feed. And the 
big strategy of the practice is to get you attached to one really good way of feeding, i.e. the concentration. So as the mind slips out after other things, you see it in action, you see it running out. You say, nope, I don't want to go there. I know that there's stress, there's suffering. It teaches you to disidentify more and more with these different selves that you've been nurturing and petting and feeding all along. And there's only one self left standing. That's the self that's in concentration. Then when you can step back from that and say, well, this too is stressful. That's how you incline the mind, as the Buddha said, to the deathless, something that doesn't change, something that doesn't involve all this selfing, all this fabricating, and all the stress that goes into fabricating. Just like following a vine, you've got this vine that's spread out. We used to have these huge vines spread out through the orchard. And you'd follow them back, follow them back, and finally you discover there's just one root. You pull out the root, and that's the end of the whole vine, all the different vines connected to it. In the same way, all these different selves, you boil them down to just this one that wants to find some true happiness. And it's convinced that this is the way. And you've managed to deal with all the other aggregates that would pull you into other senses of self. Say, nope. You can see the drawbacks of those. So that when you pull yourself out of this one, there's no place else you want to go. Not wanting to stay, not wanting to go. That's what opens the door. To something that's beyond all this. But to get there, first you have to make that struggle. Some people say, well, just let your mind wander wherever it likes and be mindful of wherever it's going. Well, the mind can play lots of tricks on itself when you do that. In fact, the whole point of distraction is the mind is playing a trick on itself. And if you don't see that, you don't see the way the mind is lying it to itself. You don't really see the fault lines in your different selves. You've got to fight the distraction, this tendency to want to go someplace else. You fight it on the one hand by seeing the drawbacks of the distraction, and on the other hand by seeing the, the value of a mind that can settle down with a sense of nourishment, a sense of well-being. As I say, it's when you fight with an enemy that you really get to know the enemy, and you really get to know your own strengths as well. And so in this case, the enemy is nobody else. It's just other selves inside you. Oftentimes the selves you've been nurturing and feeding for a long, long time. The meditation gives you a chance to step away from them. You're not trapped in the old ways that you used to negotiate with the world. You're being given a new set of skills, more mindfulness, more alertness, more ardency. In the course of mastering these skills, you'll learn an awful lot about who you think you are and who you don't want to be anymore. And as you create your sense of yourself as a meditator, that gives you a better, a better self to be, provisionally. So as you're letting go to, of these other selves, you don't feel so much regret. Because this self, as you get used to it, is a really good place to be. And as you get a sense of belonging more and more here, that shifts the center of gravity. Brings things down to being one, 
without all these divided selves. And then as a John Lee says, once it's one, then it's easy to make it zero. So put up the good fight, making it one. This is pulling you in a good direction. There's an interesting passage in the canon where the Buddha says, whatever is not you, let go of it, and that will be for your long-term welfare and happiness. Notice that, for your long-term welfare and happiness. He's not saying there's no you at all. It's just that the happiness that you find at that point doesn't have a sense of you, and it's not missing a sense of you, because it doesn't need to create it. Your sense of you is something that you create as a strategy to find happiness. That's why we have so many selves to begin with, because we've found happiness in so many different ways. But the happiness that comes at the end of the path doesn't require any sense of self to do it, because it doesn't require any action at all. So that's where this fight is headed, the state of real peace. There's so many battles you fight in the world, and they're just provisional. They set you up for another battle. But the battle among yourselves inside, when you win it, that's the end of all wars.